also have a there we go a record of that um uh and uh and then i'll just uh tell you we're, we're going to um, i'm going to ask um each of our panelists to speak for five to ten minutes and try to give you some um, guidance on both what their journal is about and um, what they see their role as editors and how you should respond to reviews. And then um, we'll have hopefully 25 to 30 minutes for questions and answers after that, and I'll, and I'll be sharing that. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce um, Polly Callister Wilkins and Daniel Muga. Um, both of them are my colleagues at the Department of Political Science at the University of Amsterdam. And um, as I was sort of saying in the pre preliminary remarks, we have a lot of journals in our, in our department and across the, the, um, the AISSR. And I guess that's your first port of call if you're interested in this sort of stuff to find out more information. Um, well, I'm gonna give it first to Polly. Polly is um, a editor at the journal Geopolitics. Uh, it's a political geography journal, um, quite a critical one, I would say. And, um, and uh, her work is on borders and humanitarianism. Um, Polly, uh, you've got five to 10 minutes um, uh, to let um, our colleagues know about um, this publishing game. Okay, so morning, everybody. It's really nice to see so many people um, in attendance um, to want to learn about the, the minutiae of uh, <laughs> the, jo the joys of uh, academic publishing or journal publishing. Um, so yeah, as Darshan said, I'm a, a co-editor at, at Geopolitics, and Geopolitics, as Darshan also said, he saw my thunder, um, was a, is a political geography journal. Um, it is, yes, it is somewhat critical, although I would argue that political geography as a, as a discipline, sub-discipline is by its nature critical these days, right? We have moved on um, from the times of sort of Mackinderism. Um, we don't, we no longer sort of, that kind of work doesn't really isn't so present in political geography these days. Um, but geopolitics has been around now for 26 years. It was our 25th anniversary last year. So we're now in our 25th uh, year, sixth year. Um, and really we publish work, as I say, on political geography for, and for those of you who are not sort of really sure about what that means, we publish work on politics, international relations that has or deals with the elements of space and time, right? So when space and time and the importance of issues of space and time um, come to impact on particular political uh, relations, political events, et cetera, et cetera, at a very, very macro level to the very, very micro level. Um, we have become somewhat of a journal known for particular types of issues. Um, and those are related to, and it's partly to do with the dynamics of our current international uh, order. Um, those are borders and migration. So we have a lot of papers on the different aspects of borders and migration, which might be, of course, very interesting for the people who are coming to this event through the migration politics um, residency. Um, and that's also partly to do with the fact that, of course, borders and migration are of, of considerable political concern in the current uh, contemporary period. Um, although <laughs> sometimes maybe a little bit too much, I would say, and sometimes we, we, we focus too much on these issues and other things get lost. But we are also, also now the, the Journal of the Belt and Road. Um, we do a lot of stuff to do with the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. Um, we also are known for doing special issues. Um, we have quite a lot of special issues. We put a call out uh, twice a year um, for special issues. Um, but we find that actually this really enables us to curate the contents of the journal really, really nicely and actually elevates um, the standards of the papers that we publish because not only do they go through the standard peer review process, um, which, is, which is rigorous, we have three peer reviewers um, for each paper at Geopolitics, um, but also, of course, the guest editors do their own rounds of peer reviewing um, and editing uh, before the papers actually even make it to our desks, my desk as, a, as an editor, to be sent out um, for peer review. Um, I think that's enough on sort of the, the, the nuts and bolts of, of Geopolitics as a journal itself, but then maybe I'll talk a little bit about what, what my role as an editor actually is, because I think sometimes I mean, let you like peer behind the curtain of like what it is that a journal actually is and does. 
um, because I think this is useful both to both to authors, but both to sort of scholars more generally and junior scholars more generally when you know they will also be asked to become peer reviewers they will also be asked to be involved in this community that we have um, that enables academic publishing to happen and if you if you kind of understand a little bit the kind of everyday mundanity in some ways of, of what we do and how we how we make a journal run um, then maybe you can understand maybe some of the sort of idiosyncrasies or um, some of the things that might be a little bit opaque um, and confusing to you. So when you submit, and I, this is not, I can't speak for every journal, of course, this is, this is how, we, how we roll at geopolitics, um, and it might be different um, elsewhere. I know I'm on an editorial board of a few other journals, and I know that things don't necessarily run in the same way um, in those journals, but I can, I can speak to the, to the everyday of geopolitics. Um, when, when an article is submitted, it is taken, our chief editor, our editor-in-chief, Rhys Jones at the University of Hawaii, um, takes a quick look at the paper, makes sure that it's actually suitable um, for publication in geopolitics. It's on, it, it deals with the geopolitical. Um, it deals with um, or engages with an adequate amount of sort of theory and literature right so it's not a policy paper right it is actually grounded in um existing scholarship um and yeah maybe or maybe not has empirics and i, I should have also said that geopolitics as a journal publishes theoretical pieces but also quite the quite empirical pieces so if you have pieces with a lot of empirics we're also very happy to publish empirical work as long very importantly, um, as it in some way um, locates that analysis within the existing literature and advances it and speaks to it to some extent. Um, so our chief editor takes a, a look, um, tests that yeah the journal is it the, the paper is sort of up to to scratch at that stage. If not, it's a desk reject. Um, and if it if it's suitable to go out to peer review, or he thinks it's suitable to go out to peer review, he will then send it on to one of the co-editors. Um, in terms of the sort of fields that I think people at this virtual seminar would be interested in, if it's to do with borders or migration, it will either come to me or go to my colleague Nancy Heemstra. Um, and we then take a look at it ourselves. We can also choose as co-editors to think that I actually know this article is not up to snuff. It doesn't um, speak to, it doesn't engage with the literature. Um, in, an, in a coherent enough way or et cetera, et cetera. Um, we also have the opportunity then also to desk reject, but then our main job is to find reviewers. Well, our next job is to try and find reviewers. Um, and I would say this is where you as an author can be really, really helpful. So you're always asked when you, when you upload your uh, papers to the, <laughs> to the online system. We all have to work with these online systems I know people find them really annoying. I know reviewers find them really annoying. Um, yeah, we just, we have to work with them. Everybody finds them annoying, but they do at least streamline and make our tasks as editors easier when we're dealing with, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of submissions of papers a year. Uh, you are asked to upload a cover letter and a cover letter to me is really, really helpful um, as the co-editor, as an editor dealing with your paper. Yes, the paper may be in my wheelhouse, but I'm still like, you know, as we know, we can't read everything. We may have a slight understanding of particular literatures, et cetera, et cetera. But it's really helpful to me to know what it is, what the debates you're speaking to and what you're trying to do with your paper, um, but also for you to suggest possible reviewers. This is not this is not, I don't read this as an editor, as you trying to influence the review process. I don't, um, I'm not stupid. Like if you suggest someone who's your direct colleague, I'm gonna be like, nice try. Um, <laughs> uh, right? But um, it's really helpful to me to know who it is that you think you would want to read your work. Um, and I think as, a, as an author, it's also, I think it makes your work stronger if you if you 
you know, allow the people whose work you engage with um, substantively or even critically, um, allow them to, to read your work. So it's really helpful to me if you, if you suggest reviewers, partly because trying to find reviewers is um, a thankless task, shall we say. Um, and uh, I will use this platform to say, please, if you get asked to review, please consider doing so. Um, we can only make, yes, the system is exploitative. Yes, it asks for unpaid labor. Yes, um, academic journals make huge multi-billion prof euro profits off of our unpaid labor, but it, we can only um, operate this system that everybody benefits from, at least benefits in the terms of getting publications if you also put in the labor to do reviews. So once I found reviewers, it goes out to review, then I have to thank this task as having to remind people to do the reviews. Sometimes this can take a really long time. I know from the, from the point of view of, of authors, this can be very frustrating when your, um, your paper's been under review for a long time. Trust me, it's also very frustrating for an editor um, to have to keep chasing the reviews. Um, we don't want your paper to be under review for a long period of time either, but you know, we're also just trying to um, you know, get people to send the reviews back. Then once the review returns, the reviews return with their, their recommendations. As an editor, my job is then to, to read the reviews, to think about whether the reviews are actually a fair reading of the paper. So I do, I mean, I do also exercise my subjective judgment. I sometimes will edit the reviews if the reviews are unnecessarily cruel. Um, and that does happen. Um, nobody needs to read stuff which is which is not helpful constructive criticism um, and generous criticism um, and then I will make a decision on the paper based on the reviews of the three colleagues the three peer reviewers who will have reviewed it um, and my own um, understanding of the paper then it will be sent back to you if it's a revise and resubmit it's sent back to you um, and you are then asked to sort of deal with the revisions. And in terms of dealing with the revisions, I would say the most important thing that you can do is to be thorough, yes, but also to recognize that you don't, you don't have to do everything, right? Because sometimes the review, sometimes you're very lucky and all the reviewers pull in the same direction. Sometimes you will have conflicting, contradictory reviews. And my also my role as an editor is when sending you back your paper with a revise and resubmit is to give you at least my suggestions for how I think you can approach the reviews. Um, so I might sort of push you um, to consider review a one or review a three or review a twos, um, particular points um, and ignore some of the other things or not ignore but to sort of take less seriously some of the other things. And when you are writing your reviews, I think the most your response to your reviews and doing your reviews, of course, um, the most important thing or one of the most important things you can do is to be to be very clear on what it is you've done. Right. So it really helps when you copy comments from the reviews into your response and say, I have done this and then show me as the editor who reads them how. And then the reviewers, because it gets sent back to the reviewers to decide whether or not you have adequately addressed the reviews. So remember that. Um, so also when you're, when you're writing your response to the reviewers, make sure you don't be a smart ass, right? Basically don't be a dick is what I'm saying. Um, Cause the reviewer, you know, some reviews are also some reviewers can be dicks, but also don't be a dick in response because that's just going to annoy everybody. Um, but also if you haven't done something and there's a very good reason for you not doing it, own that and say why, right? Because sometimes, you know, the reviewers are not um, God, right? <laughs> They're not omnipotent. Sometimes, you know, they, they, you can ignore what they say or you think it's less important or you think it detracts from your argument. Um, and so it's up to you to, 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 to push back in a way that um, does your work and what you're trying to do justice, but also signal that to the editor, right? So when you've done your reviews, let me as the editor know, okay, I haven't done this and this is why, right? And I will read that. And I, if I consider, actually, I still think you do need to do that a little bit, like I will also tell you, 
Um, but I think, you know, it, the important thing is to also recognize that sometimes you can't do everything. Um, and, you know, to, to be really, really clear as to what it is that you've done, um, be polite, <laughs> be thankful, don't be too like, too obsequious, that's, that's also not nice. Um, but, you know, I think that's, that's as when you're responding to reviewers, um, the most, the, at least from my perspective as an editor, and I think from the perspective of my colleagues on geopolitics, at least from the, the discussions that we have in editorial meetings, um, that is the, the most useful um, way to approach the review process. Darshan's now asking me to wrap it up. So I'm going to wrap it up. Um, and then I can, I'm happy to answer any questions in the Q&A afterwards. Thanks, Polly. Um, that was really helpful and also to like get you know behind the scenes and see how geopolitics works and also to tell a story from your perspective as an editor. Now I'm going to move just quickly on to Daniel Muga, our second panelist. Um, Daniel used to work on um, the review of international political economy, so also somewhat of a subdisciplinary or transdisciplinary journal, but even in a very different sort of area of the field than where Polly used to work. Um, I think you stopped working there in 2016, but spent a lot of time on that journal obviously you also have a lot of experience in publishing and, and responding to review it yourself. I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Darshan. Uh, thanks uh, for inviting me to this. Um, and, and I too already have learned quite a bit, uh, again, uh, you know, from your comments, but also particularly from Polly's, uh, you know, trying to get a better grasp, but not least of the diversity that we find in journal land. Um, one of the things that strikes me and has struck me over the years is that procedures and routines at different journals are quite varied. Um, the Review of International Political Economy um, is a journal that, as the name implies, publishes international political economy work, um, a tradition that originally was a, you know, consciously political alternative to work on economic issues, you know, it was about, you know, consciously bringing the politics back in to the kinds of topics that hadn't frequently been addressed in economics kinds of journals. Um, since then, I would say that it has branched out in many different directions, um, such that it covers a whole range of issues that have to do with basically the economic and political side of global politics. So everything from global value chains, global inequalities, but also things that have to do, say, with climate change and economic transformation, um, particular, as I said, dimensions of inequalities, things of money and finance. So it's a pretty broad kind of journal. As Darshan said, my own role there was that I was editor and then for two years, the lead editor of that journal. And the comments that I have today will mostly focus on that. Um, as I said, I think a key thing to realize as an author is that the editorial routines differ at different journals. And I think there are a few dimensions here where it is particularly useful for you as an author to be aware of where the journal with which you're working stands. So there are some journals where there is a lot of editorial discretion, basically meaning that the editors both at this initial stage that Polly talked about, where a decision is made whether something is desk rejected without being sent out to reviews or not. Um, at some journals, editors there already apply a pretty heavy filter where a lot of this stuff is already thrown out. And there are other journals where if the submitted manuscripts meet minimum requirements, it will be sent on into the review process. I think for you as an author, it will be important to have a sense of what's going on there because that will influence whom you will have to convince at that initial stage that the paper really is a worthwhile proposition for the journal in question. One of the things that Polly mentioned was the importance of a cover letter. And my impression there is that there is significant variation in how serious different journals take these cover letters. So from my own experience at the Review of International Political Economy, I was most focused in that initial stage on the first, say, one and a half page of the, of the actual manuscript. So a lot of the work that Polly mentioned, she wants to be done in the cover letter. And I think that's a perfectly plausible proposition, namely explaining why this is an important paper that should find a home in that particular journal. That's the kind of thing that I, and I guess my colleagues at 
the review of international political economy as well, expected to happen in those first one and a half pages. And it didn't, if it didn't happen there, and we came out of those thinking, why is this being sent to us? What's the value added? That doesn't seem to be quite clear. We would definitely start seeing question marks in our minds as to whether this was a winning proposition there. So advice for you as an author is try to find out, for example, from other people who have already published with the journal that you're working with, which traditions basically prevail there. Most of the cover letters that we received at our journal had a very perfunctory nature. So we're dear editors, here's my paper XYZ. I hope you'll like it. Uh, looking forward to hear from you. I think that was easily 90% of the cover letters that we got. And we worked with that as well. So that was okay for us. Now, the main topic of this seminar is about what do you do once you get the reviews back and the letter from the editorial board. And I think Polly has already mentioned a whole range of really useful points about things that you want to keep in mind. Um, let me add um, a few additional ones. Um, when it comes to the format in which you respond, so separate from the revisions of the manuscript itself, but the format in which you respond, I think Polly is absolutely right that you do want to be very concrete into what you've done. And I think that includes making things easy for everybody. Um, editing a journal and also reviewing papers is a lot of work. So the more you can make life easy for the reviewers and the editors, the better. So if you have, for example, as Polly mentioned, you can copy paste things from the review. I'd also be fine if you say, you know, if you were to take the whole reviews, if they're not super mega long, and then say, for example, color code them and, and intersperse your own reactions, color marked in a different color so that I can immediately see what's going on. Some people go to making a table where they say, here are like the five main points that come out. Here is you know, the, the five main comments or criticisms. And then in a separate column, here's what I've done with them. Anything that from your common sense point of view makes things easy for the people who will have to work with your material again, will be extremely welcome, both for clarity and for you know, being constructive in this process. About the tone of the reviewer response, I think also there Polly is right. You want to try to hit the right note. You don't want to come across as, as arrogant or dismissive, but also not as submissive in this whole thing. So be confident, but not combative. Um, I think what can be very useful are two additional things. Sometimes there are opportunities for playing reviewers off against each other. Uh, namely that you say, well, you know, the reviews have pointed to, do, to two different ways, uh, you know, Reviewer A says, you know, broaden the scope of the paper. A reviewer B says, make it more focused. And obviously you can't satisfy both demands at the same time. I think there it's useful to make explicit that, you know, you've, that there is a contradiction between the things that you're being asked to do. And unless there was specific guidance from the editorial board already, you can say, well, you know, here are two ways to go. Having thought about this, you know, we choose this particular way, which also means we can't do what reviewer A asked us to do. As I mentioned before, it's important for you to know how exactly to the degree that you can, this process works. So sometimes I've seen journals, they get all the material back from the authors. So the revised manuscript and the response to the reviewers and they more or less immediately send that on to the initial reviewers again. So they'll get the stuff, they hit the send button and there it goes. And then again, it's up to the reviewers to decide what's going on. If in the letter that you have received as an author, there was editorial guidance that said, dear author, we suggest that you do A, B and C. There were also suggestions D, E, F, but maybe don't take those too seriously, really concentrate on A, B, C. It's important for you, I think, in the response to these reviews to make that explicit again. Because if I'm reviewer, if I'm the reviewer who had made suggestions D, E, F, and you don't do those things, it will be good for you as an author if you say in your response, well, you know, there were suggestions D, E, F following the guidance from the editors. I have not done these, but done these other things. Because otherwise, as a reviewer, when I get that manuscript back and I look at it again, and I'm like, oh, I had suggested you should do these things and they've been flat out ignored. It will help if I know that you've done that at the advice of the journal editors rather than just not taking these things seriously at all. 
So anything that you can do the moment you don't comply, as it were, of course, you don't have to, but if you don't follow the suggestions of the reviewers and you have good reasons for doing so, trying to make that clear and trying to deflect criticism or you know, potentially even irritation on the side of the reviewers, uh, such that they'll say, yeah, okay, these revisions were reasonable. You know, you want them to give a, a thumbs up. It doesn't have to be a round of applause from the reviewers, but a thumbs up. That's what you're looking for. And anything you can do to create a sense that you've done your due diligence and basically tick the boxes so that the thing can move on, that will be good. Now, um, a final point here. Um, I think it's important to realize that uh, there is an editorial process the way it would ideally look, you know, with everybody putting in loads of work, reading everything really carefully, thinking about it very long, extended amounts of time. And then there's what really happens, which is that as has always been the case, but it's also certainly the case now in this pandemic environment that people will find themselves forced to cut corners sometimes, read things a little bit superficially, not spend oceans of time on things less than they should or we would want to. And what that means is that I think there are sometimes limits to what you really can do here. So that means being concise sometimes in your responses. You know, if you have a, a cover letter that's this long, trying to explain all sorts of things why your paper really was great, you may be substantially correct, but chances are that people will not really take that terribly seriously, not because they shouldn't, but because they simply find that they don't really have time and energy at 11 at night still to do that. I mean, that's unfortunate reality frequently. Um, so suggestion to you there is also to realize that there are limits to what you can do as an author. You can do your best, you can try to cut in there, but there is also, I guess, you know, the curve of, you know, the marginal value added of spending more and more words on trying to explain what you're trying to do is also at some point limited. So I think in doing what seems reasonably plausible is good, but, you know, unfortunately get used to the reality that I think also in this publishing world, sometimes things, do happen that are unfair. People make suggestions where even if you fulfill them, they'll still reject the paper. That's part of the way this thing goes and don't, don't take these things too hard and also you know, don't make this process too hard on yourself. Okay, I'll stop there for the moment. Thanks, Daniel, that's super helpful. And like really um, giving a lot of strategic tips um, uh, to, to, uh, to authors and also I really like the fact that you know you bring some reality to the table to say like it doesn't actually work as perfectly as we'd always like to. I'm going to try and be really quick because I want to get to q and um, just to, to mention that in addition to you know just starting off this new journal Migration Politics um, I'm going to speak really from the perspective of the European as an editor of the European Journal of International Relations um, we see ourselves, um, just to be really quick, as a mainstream IR journal with a bit of a constructivist bent, right? Like that's kind of, uh, you know, our background and, and who we are. Um, so we publish anything in the field of international relations, um, broadly conceived. Um, and I guess we see ourselves as, as a journal and Daniel, I really like the way in which you said there are different policies for different journals and you really have to sort of try and um, get a sense about how um, these different journals will work. We see ourselves as a, as a journal where the editors have a lot of discretion, but quite controlled discretion that's exercised in specific moments. And for me as an editor, that main moment is the writing of a decision letter, right? So once I have the reviews back and I have the opportunity to say, to try to say either A, I, I just don't think that this is gonna make it at the EJAR and these are the reasons why, or B, and this is, I guess, for the, the moment that we're talking about now, that, you know, you've got a shot and, uh, and we're giving you a revise and resubmit opportunity. And what I try to do in my decision letter is, is craft a pathway to publication, right? To say, these are the steps that you need to make based on these two reviews in order to, to for this piece to get up at, at EJAR. Um, and, and you can see this, so when you receive these letters, they're quite boilerplate, right? You know, you, you see there's a lot of text, but the actual writing only takes place in a few paragraphs, usually underneath the, the, the point which you're all looking for when you get these letters, right? Is this an r, &R? Yes, it's an r, &R. And then there'll be four or five points where your editor tries to pass the information from the reviewers. And as Daniel said, 
emphasize the key points that you need to address. And my strategy as an author is to really start with those three, three to five to six points that the editors identified and say, I'm now preparing two documents. I'm preparing a cover letter and I'm preparing the revised manuscript. And these two things will sit side by side. And what I'm going to do is first of all, group underneath those editors points, all of the bits of information from the reviewers that I think sort of can be summarized as, you know, this is method, uh, this is um, the case study, uh, this is uh, the engaging with other literature and try to begin almost sometimes I'll even start writing the cover letter before I've done the revisions, right? It's like, it's really my, this is what I went about doing because what you're doing in writing your cover letter is you're, you're speaking to some, you're speaking to the editor primarily and you're speaking to them to say, you have told me that I have a shot and this is what I need to do. This is how I did it. Um, and, and really, in, as Daniel was saying, we don't have much time, so page numbers. Um, this is the point in the manuscript where I do this. Real specifics without um, taking too much space. Um, and and try to try to you know use that cover letter as a disciplinary device for yourself, right? To say, okay, like now if I want to get up at this journal, these are the things that I need to do. Um, and and uh, and as I don't know, different editors work work differently, but my my general way in which I try to read those cover letters and then read the new uh, and revised manuscript is is to look for due diligence, right? Like has that you know we know if this paper has gone out to review this scholar is good right they, they they've got good material um if they've gotten to an r and r this is publishable material and now it's really have they done the work right and have they really um uh yeah done the work to, to get through and, and followed the pathway that we've suggested towards publication in our journal i think daniel made another and I, I, whether it was daniel or polly but like one of the key tricks that i think um you know, little little tricks that you can use that I think uh, authors often don't is to really try to take the positive comments from reviewers and use them to your advantage in the cover letter, right? Particularly as as I will say, if you don't want to do something, <laughs> if you want to, you know, use your ability to push back a little bit and say, hey, you know, like I like what R one is saying, but hey, uh, you know, uh, this conflicts with what R two is saying is the major strength of this paper. So I'm gonna really you know, not do that so much, right? And and so that, that's a sort of language that you can utilize to really make your case in, in your cover letter. Um, finally, it's, I think, you know, just a sort of a contextual point. Um, I think one of the things that you can do in your cover letters and, and where you can make some ground, and, and at least when you're writing them, how you should think about the, the sort of the genre is that you also may be trying to write something that's going to in some way empower your editor. And that seems like maybe strange, but often these decisions are collegial, right? Often, particularly the line ball calls where it's not quite clear whether this gets towards acceptance or whether it, it goes um, uh, in the other direction. Um, there'll be a discussion and there'll be a discussion using your letter and the reviews about what do we do here? And, and what you want to do is to really um, provide the material that that editor can go into that meeting and say, hey, look, this is these are these points. This is what I think they've done. Maybe there's two or three things that are left out. But actually, on the whole, this has made substantial improvement down the pathway. And even if you're just getting to another you know, set of more minor revisions, that's a big step. It's an important step in, in, any, uh, in publishing in any journal. Um, those are just my, my main comments. I'd really like to, to move on to, to the Q&A. Um, I'm just going to now have to like kind of switch brains to, to, the, to, the, um, to the chat box. And what I'll try to do is just read out the questions in full and then um, um, really give Polly and, and Daniel um, the, the floor in trying to, to respond and answer to them. Um, so the first question we have, I think is a follow up from something that Polly said, wait, there's, there's a chat and now there's also the Q&A. So I'm going to be doing some juggling. Um, the first question was from Patricia, who is one of our residents at the Migration Policy uh, Politics Residency, and she asks, actually it's to Daniel, about the length of responses to reviewers. Um, there's a tendency to have massive near 20 to 30 pages of responses to an R&R, &R, 
what's your opinion? And I, I'd like to hear, I guess, both Polly and, and, and Daniel's opinion, but maybe Daniel first. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, my intuition is that these things shouldn't be too long, um, as long as necessary, but no longer than that. Um, I guess the key is that ultimately you want to be compelling. And I guess, you know, there is a degree of verbosity that's not compelling. So it's like an inverted U curve. If it's too short, then it's not compelling. But if it's too long, then it feels that people don't really know, you know, that they're kind of like waffling around the thing. So um, double digit pages to my ears sounds too long. Uh, I would prefer something that's more pithy. Um, having said that, um, I think a format, and it depends a little bit on the length of the reviews as well. Um, uh, I think it is in principle fine to either copy paste or in a table or something, take out the main points from these reviews. But if you need more time explaining what it is that you've done, then there is text in these reviews. And I think things get a little bit tricky. Ultimately, you know, what's decisive is still the revised manuscript itself. So I think what helps, for example, is if, again, traditions may differ in different journals, but when you submit your revisions, if you upload both a clean version and one, I've seen that frequently, and I think it happens more and more often, it's at least my experience. If you also upload a version that has track changes turned on so that you can see in the PDF file where things have been amended. And then for us as editors, you can very quickly see that in the first three sections, it's just like a few references that have been changed and some final typos. And then in section three, all of a sudden, like there are these three, these three pages of new text where you really try to change the take on X, Y, Z. And for me as an editor, when I'm trying to figure out, okay, you know, is this new literature review better than the previous one or something like that, then I can immediately go to that document, see what the new stuff is that you've written and check. Right? So that's both in the category of making our lives easy and those of the reviewers, but also in the category of where you can basically cross-reference very quickly in the response to the reviewers slash cover letter um, saying, oh, by the way, you know, here's this uh, thing on page three that I've written in you. Uh, here's in a nutshell what it does, but go check it out. You can find it all in the revised document. Holly, did you want to add to that or do you want to field something else? Let me know. No, that 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 would be exactly what I how how I would answer that question. Um, but I also, I mean, I to be honest, I haven't come across reviews of twenty to thirty pages. I respond. No. I don't think that's that common, to be honest. Um, um, I, there's a question from Laura Clayton. Hi, Laura. Um, so asking whether she's wondering whether I can expand on the editor's role after reviews come in. She blah blah blah. She's yeah. Um, Laura, I don't know. I mean, I would say personally that that's poor editorial work on the part of the editor. Um, but again, I mean, we're all really overworked and I don't want to, you know, I mean, we do this stuff in our in our spare time, right? We, we don't get paid for this. We don't get extra time for this. We do this um, as a service to the to the to the academic world. Um, where the, so yeah, I mean, I would say that that's poor, poor editorship. Um, but I would also say that, I mean, you should have had other reviews and it depends what those reviews say. Um, and I, as Darshan said, I think you can, you can, um, you know, use the other reviews to your advantage in this respect. Um, and I think you do, if you do feel that the reviewer is pushing you in a way, as you say, it wasn't particularly harsh, but the reviewer is pushing you in a way that is trying to change the argument of your paper, then you need to say that, right? Um, peer reviewers, there's this weird thing with peer review, right? That we, it's the best thing that we have, I think, as a way to ensure quality, but at the same time, it's not it's not foolproof, right? It's not, it's not this, it itself is not always correct, right? It's important, um, it's the best we have, but you know, peer reviews are not, are not always sacrosanct in that sense, right? And I think as an author, it's about, you know, being able to respond to those reviews in ways that, you know, also show that you know what you're talking about, right? That show that you are also an expert in this field and that you're able to 
um, pass, you know, suggestions which you go, okay, yeah, that's that's really fair. I, I didn't do that. Yeah, absolutely right. Or yes, that's absolutely strengthened my paper. I wasn't aware of that particular literature, or I wasn't aware of that. Or yes, that wasn't clear. Um, and those suggestions, which you know, we've all seen that that joke meme where you know the car ends up with like twelve wheels and like you know a rocket launcher. And no, Darshan hasn't seen this meme. Surely everybody's seen the meme, right? Your paper when it comes back after peer review, where it was a nice little little well designed car, and then it comes back and it's like it looks like a cross between a car, a tank, an airplane, and a ship. Um, so I think yeah, that's that's what you should do but I would I mean I would say and I think there's nothing wrong if you end up in that position of writing to the editor and asking like what should I do mm. like I'm confused this is confusing um you know I would say flag it with the editor and it from my position as an editor and I can't speak for everybody to me that shows you being um a thorough scholar Right, it doesn't show weakness on your part. It doesn't show an inability to do the review. It's uh, it's good practice. Thanks. I'm gonna like offer like just two quick ones. I reckon two to three pages for a cover letter. That's and I'm putting in the chat what the EJIR guidance is on how to write a cover letter. Um, so just feel free to use that as a as a sort of a way to test the winds. And secondly, there are two types of uh, journals. Like I call them sort of like post office box journals, right? Like where they're like the editor receives it, it goes straight out to the reviewers, the reviewers play the role of the judge and jury, and then the editor allows that decision. I think Daniel referred to this. And then there's ones where, where editors play a stronger role. I would try to publish in, in journals where editors play a stronger role. I think I think that's that's where these sorts of problems that Laura's identifying tend to get picked up and, and, and addressed. I've got a question from Rosella Marino, um, and she asked an interesting one about, um, I'll just read it out. Uh, has COVID-19 affected the way that reviewing is done? And for example, are reviewers more understanding towards limited data collection because of fieldwork disruptions during COVID? And if not, what would your suggestion be to help the author overcome this shortcoming? Do either of you have any ideas on that? Uh, be clear, right? I mean, I don't think, I can't speak for a review. I mean, I we're, as a reviewer, yeah, I mean, I do also alongside doing my editorial work, I also do a lot of reviewing. I probably do a review every two weeks, um, which is probably way too much, but yeah, that's, I get a lot of stuff to review and I, I feel bad for saying no, because I know how hard it is from the editorial side to find reviewers. Um, I think you'd be, as from a reviewer's perspective, I would say I would be sympathetic, but I need to know that COVID is why you have limited data. Right. If you don't tell me, I don't know. Right. So be clear. And that's about being reflexive in, in your methodology. Um, and obviously different journals recall ask for different levels of reflexivity. Um, but at geopolitics, for example, we are very happy if you um, are reflexive in your methodology. And but also flag it in your cover letter to the editor. That's the kind of thing that you should flag um, yeah, in your cover letter as well. My two cents on that will be that um, I think it it's, it's useful to say something about how you've dealt with the challenges that COVID-19 has thrown your way, such that you've still been able to produce a superb piece of scholarship. What I think wouldn't play to your advantage that you say, sorry for submitting a substandard piece, it's COVID. Um, uh, you know, I think there are different kinds of challenges that this pandemic has thrown our way in terms of being able to do research as we would like are widely appreciated, maybe not always by our superiors and the rest of the planet as we'd like, but I think we're all familiar with them. Having said that, um, I think we shouldn't expect journals necessarily, and I don't mean it as a normative, but just as an empirical thing, we shouldn't expect journals to be willing to lower their standards in terms of the strength of the scholarship. Um, you know, for that, I think there's still also still too much good work out there. And if your particular line of research has suffered particularly from you know, the impact of the pandemic, then that's really unfortunate. And I mean that, um, but that won't necessarily mean that you know, something that you haven't been able to pull off now would still get published. I think the strategy to employ, as I said earlier, is one where you say, 
oh yeah, you know, here is how we've been how we've been able to do this in spite of these challenges. And then when somebody comes back later in the review says, oh, you should have talked in person to 50 people at the train station, then you can say, yeah, sure, would have liked to, wasn't able to do that, COVID. Here's this other thing that we did that was also great, actually was quite fantastic. So check. I mean, that's the way to, to work with something like this. Great stuff. Um, I'm going to ask a question from an anonymous attendee, whoever you are out there. It's a good one. Um, in my experience, reviews often ask for additional consideration of material and literature, additional explanation, etc. But they never suggest what should be cut. <laughs> how, how do you approach extensive editions, keeping in mind the limits of articles? And this is a this is a real problem. Uh, so, good luck, guys. My own impression is when I write things, uh, I still introduce lots of material. Um, as a, that doesn't have quite have a disclaimer function, but where I feel I need to cover all these different bases, there needs to be a little bit of historical background because maybe somebody reads it, doesn't know the history, and then they'll say, where's the history? And then I'll throw in something else again, because I feel, oh, uh, well, maybe they might be looking for that. And then once the reviews come back um, and there are certain kinds of criticisms, but then other things also seem to be okay. When I read my own pieces again, I find that now that I've sort of like gone over that first hurdle, there's quite a bit of stuff that, you know, d maybe deserves to be in a footnote, but that I had really just kind of put in there to kind of like cover my back. And that, you know, being over that first hurdle and now being only required to make sure that I keep my own punchy argument and address the criticisms or suggestions from the reviewers, I find myself identifying material myself, often somewhere within the first, you know, somewhere between page two and a half and seven or something that can actually be compressed quite substantially because yes, it may be nice prose, but it's not really essential. And given that nobody has really complained too much about it, it can be quite comfortably compressed down. Um, I think you can again, and it's, you know, resonates with something that we've said a number of times now, I think pointing that out, you know, in a letter to say, you know, in order to make space for these super helpful suggestions about expanding X, Y, Z, you know, I've condensed the history bit uh, in section two or something. You can always flag that, lest somebody says at a later stage, "Hey, what happened to your beautiful history?" Um, but I think reading again it with your with that set of eyes will maybe itself give you or highlight points where you can cut without losing the punch of your argument and maybe actually making the piece better. Can I jump in there? Just a really practical tip. I think everything Dennis says is, is absolutely spot on, but also when the, the word limits of journals are a limit, right? It's not a, it's not a, it's not something you have to aim for. It's not a target you have to hit. So, I mean, what I do, and I'm talking about for what I do as an author is I often write below the limit so that when you get, right, and you, you may be, and then when you, so if someone asks, oh, you need to add this, you're like, okay, I have a thousand, I have 15,000 words to play with. Here's some more stuff, right? So remember, it's a limit. It's not a target you have to hit. That's just a practical Good. advice. And I know it's hard, it's academics, we love to waffle on, but, you know, succinct is sometimes cool. <laughs> um. Uh, I've got two questions from Ellen. One I'm going to send to the panel. One I'm just going to quite try and briefly answer myself. Um, you know, Ellen Allegra asks, is it okay to check with the editors if, if it's a fit or not? And I think that's okay. Uh, just be very brief in your communication and don't try to use it to get your foot in the door, right? Like it's very clear when people are going, hey, I've got this nice stuff. Can you give me a softball um, route to um, sending up review? We can sense that. So like if it's really a, you have a topical question, then I, sure, editors are happy to receive those questions. Um, and then uh, Ellen's second question, which you guys might want to answer, do you know of good example letters or instructions for writing good cover letters for first submission that you could re recommend? Um, I mean, I have, I, just to while you guys gather your thoughts, I have one, one suggestion. You are probably working at an academic department of some sort or working with a lot of colleagues. Ask your friends, right? They've all written, Daniel's probably written 50 cover letters in his, in his life and 
probably some of them were good, right? They, they got they got that piece through to the publication. Um, and and that I've always found that there's always like this generic text that people put together and frame really well that you can just kind of cut and paste, particularly in that first paragraph. And also just to get the tone, I find like sometimes when, when I receive cover letters, there's, there's a new tendency to be really, really effusive, like of like, oh, reviewer one is such a fantastic fellow and I would like to do everything that, that, um, that they've suggested. And please cut that out. Like, you know, just like the, there's other ways in which you can show a generosity of spirit and, um, and, uh, and a real um, intellectual engagement without the sort of flowery language and that sort of stuff. So yeah, I would ask, ask friends, um, colleagues uh, to, to provide you with that. Anything from you yeah, guys? Yeah, just on that, a, a few years ago, and I don't know where it is, it's, it'll be somewhere on the internet. Um, I don't have it to hand right now, but um, I remember Claudia Aradow when she was um, editor in chief of Security Dialogue wrote a really great piece on how to write a cover letter. Um, and it's somewhere online, so just <laughs> if you are going to look it up. Um, but again, with the caveats that Daniel um, mentioned at the beginning, right? That was how to write a cover letter for the kinds of journals like Security Dialogue, like Geopolitics, um, that are more on the kind of qualitative side of everything. Um, but yeah, that was really helpful, I think, for a lot of people. Um, and really helpful for me to know that what I'd been doing was actually the right kind of thing to do. That I hadn't been given a bum steer um, by people back in the day. Um, Sarif has a question um, whether you have, some, so there's a new genre or new type of decision out there, <laughs> right? Which is maybe not so new, which is, do you have specific suggestions for reject and resubmit decisions. Um, and I imagine this is one of those areas where different journals do different things and have different policies. Um, do you guys have any thoughts on that? Well, I recall that we had very uh, 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 long debates about this at, at RIPE. Um, I remember that I, as lead editor, introduced this category. Um, and then received serious pushback, so such that now I have second thoughts about it. The reason I introduced it because, is because quite frequently we received papers where I was sympathetic to the endeavor, but felt that it was so purely executed that there was no way of salvaging the whole thing, even you know, e either initially or after a first round of reviews. And what I tended to write back was, oh, I love your effort. I wish you would have written a different paper. If you ever do, please send it to me because I really like what you're doing. That was the spirit behind it. And the feedback that I got from my colleagues was, and I'll get to your specific question, what to do with these things, was that it was maybe well-intentioned, but often really not quite helpful for the authors. And it was, yeah, it was not such a useful verdict. Um, I don't know to what degree that uh, uh, sentiment animates uh, uh, other journals or editors when they use this particular category, by now I'm happier with something that either says, yeah, we look forward to moving forward with this piece, or this is the end of the road, go try somewhere else. By now I'm in favor of that kind of clarity. I think it makes everybody's life easier. When you do receive that kind of a response, um, I think the key was, so, so by now I don't like it anymore, even though I was the one who pushed it initially at our journal. Um, I think it will be super important to write to to try to read between the lines of the letter that you receive with it, where they put the bar for resubmitting something. Is this really just a way of saying reject, but we do like you, but reject? In that case, you're kind of like back to square one. The only thing that you get is permission to resubmit a more or less different piece on the same topic again, and they won't balk at it. You know, that's okay. Or is it like a mega, mega, mega revise and resubmit? Um, that's unclear. And I think that lack of clarity is what I dislike about that category by now. Um, unless you have a strong indication that they really would like a, a 2.0 version of that piece, you might just take it as a reject and kind of like try to think afresh about uh, what to do with this piece. 
Holly, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I know what Daniel said. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I would I would only add one small thing is that the, the category of article that I tend to use that for are uh, um, authors writing from you know non-traditional backgrounds or regions um, who where I feel like that's where I feel like our, our journal has a mandate to try and move beyond um, its traditional authorship. And for me, it's only an offer that I would make where I'm prepared to do some additional coaching to get that thing over the line, right? And to get it into review. Um, so yes, if, if you find yourself in that sort of category and, and authors are, and editors are reaching out in that spirit, then, then I think take advantage of it, like I would suggest. But, um, but like those are the, I guess, you know, some difficult reading between the lines sorts of uh, questions as well. Um, we are running short of time. Um, uh, I am I'm gonna field one more question and then I would, I'm gonna offer to do this. I know I wanna let Polly and Daniel uh, get off to their day jobs, um, but I'm happy to hang out and, uh, and try to work through like this, this chat box. And, um, and if you wanna stay on the, the, the call, I'm more than happy to try and field as many of these questions as, as possible. Um, how does that sound as a, as a way forward? For you guys i'm also happy to stay on okay i only um, have to go as i told you and, and actually write a response to it <laughs> okay okay um also well, um, okay let's let's do this then um uh so young jun um writes when i revise my papers one of the difficult things for me that was to judge if i've done enough to reflect the feedback of the reviewers I didn't feel comfortable to ask my colleagues who've already spent time reading and commenting on my draft papers. In most cases, I ended up trusting my judgment. But do you have any tips on how I can do better in this case? I, I think you've answered your own question. That like, <laughs> you can ask your colleagues, but if you feel like you're imposing too much, then don't, and then trust your judgment. And I think sometimes you do just have to trust your judgment because apart from asking your colleagues, I don't know who else, or trusting your judgment, I don't know what, where the third way is there, um, you know? And so I think you do have to trust your judgment. And I, I would say most of the time, if you've done the things that Daniel and I have suggested you do, um, then I think, you know, most of the time that's pretty, that's good, right? I mean, I have yet to really, I mean, I very rarely come across actually a poor response to reviewers, to be honest. Um, I think once your your paper gets to the R and R stage and you know you're prepared to do the work to put in the revisions, um, you know, that it's at a standard and your your ability to respond is at a standard that actually this isn't really a problem. I know, I mean it is I I've kind of now just destroyed the whole reason why we're having this seminar, webinar or whatever. But um, I think you can trust your judgment. And if you're not, and if you're not um, sure, you can always flag that in the response to the editor, in the cover letter. Um, I mean, Darshan's going, oh, no, don't do that. Um, but I think, I mean, maybe I approach editing in a different kind of a way with a kind of feminist care ethic. I don't know. Um, but I would rather you, you flagged your concern about that to me as the editor, um, than you just, you know, if you were concerned about it, then you just let it fly. Um, because I'm going to be, I try to be as, um, kind and as supportive. I mean, I want, I mean, if your paper's got an R and R, we want it to get somewhere, right? Um, so I'm trying to help you. So give me the tools to help you. Um, so yeah, and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that as a. I'm not really sure if I pitched this right as a kind of as something bad, especially as you know, academia and publishing, academic publishing is an international game, right? And there are different cultural expectations. There are different ways that um, people write um, across cultures. Right, I come from an Anglo context, um, and even within the Anglo context, that's different, right? So the way that British people will respond to things compared to how Americans will respond to things, there is a difference there, right? Um, so just help me, basically, help me help you. 
<laughs> well, I guess I guess the the final thing, and, and I I will have to go after this. I have a PhD sure, yeah. coming up. Yeah. Uh, I think what's important there is again to realize that there are limits to how much you have this in your own hands. Um, you know, there is these are arbitrary numbers, but fifty percent you can kind of like manage by getting the letter right, getting the revisions themselves right, so on and so forth. But there is another 50% that is really just a question of good or bad luck, namely having a person there who's sympathetic to your piece or not, who has a good day, has a bad day, who has farmed out the decision to the reviewers or takes it all into his or her own hands. And there's like a gazillion other things that you really can't control. And for better or worse, I guess probably for worse, uh, but in academia and in publishing in particular, you know, there remains a serious lottery aspect to this whole thing, whether it's about journal articles, books, grants, obviously, whatever else. Um, and what that means is I think there are limits to how much energy you should put into trying to get this absolutely perfectly right, to get those final 5% right, um, you know, if this was only about this one project that you were ever going to do, I'd say, yeah, sure, you know, go invest all your time in that. But, you know, considering that this is like a marathon that we run with, you know, many publications over the years without trying to overexpend ourselves, without trying to get too frustrated, there will be rejections even after a round of reviews, even after you felt that you've done the best you could possibly do. And that's super frustrating and irritating, but that's also part of it. And so, you know, trying to remain or, or, or trying to keep, I don't know whether that's the right word, but somewhat kind of like a, a little bit of a healthy distance also to what's going on there, you know, trying to do your best, but not losing nights of sleep over it, I think also makes sense. So trusting your judgment there, I think is the right thing to be doing. And if you get a reject in the end, doesn't mean that your judgment was wrong, but maybe that it was simply like the other 50% kicking in at this time around not working in your favor. And I think that's irritating, a bummer, certainly for people who are trying to build their careers, but that's part of it. And a little bit of distance from that, I think is also helpful. Thanks, Daniel. And I'll, I'll let you go. And thank you for, for participating in the, in the panel. And I hope you get to enjoy some of the spring and perhaps summer in Berlin. All right. Hey, thanks so much. And thanks for the great questions. Uh, also, Bye, love from you both. Yeah, take care. Bye bye. Ciao, ciao. Um, so we've got, I think, two more questions in the Q&A and then we'll bring things to a close. Um, uh, the next one is from Zhao Zhuan. Uh, and I, ha I have an article, first draft, that has been written on the topic of understanding rising states aid refusal response to the crisis. I try to answer why do rising states sometimes accept humanitarian aid when facing a crisis, whereas other times they choose to refuse the donors. I would like to know how to quickly find a suitable journal for publishing. And maybe we can not necessarily address this specific question, but talk generally about this. Um, could you tell me whether this article, article is suitable for your journal directions? I mean, I'm going to answer this on how to how to find a suitable journal generally right and i mm. think and i think that also answers in, in some ways the question of should you write to the editor to ask whether the article is suitable i mean i think the main thing when trying to decide and uh, on a destination for your article is yeah or at least what i do i don't know if other people do this i've never actually asked my colleagues what what they do in in terms of their publishing strategies but i publish in the journals that i read right <laughs> I send my articles to the journals where those conversations are happening. Um, I send my articles to the journals that contain the work that I am drawing on um, in crafting my article and crafting my lit review and crafting my theory or whatever, or, or speaking to you know, an empirical case. Um, and so I, mean, I, I do think it's important when you when you submit something to a journal that you have done some of the work in like, okay, does this journal do the kind of does this journal publish the kind of work that I'm doing right um, look at look at the kind of work that it produces. Um, you know, I, I don't think it matters, but I think it certainly plays a bit of a role if in your in your bibliography, there is not one reference to the journal that you're publishing in, right? Um, that just looks a little bit like, 
do, do you know what we do? <laughs> um, and the reviewers, I mean, it, as an editor, like I noticed that, but then the reviewers often pick up on it. Um, and, you know, often one of the main reasons for a reject in geopolitics that comes from the reviewers actually as well. I mean I might think this but I, I leave it up to the reviewers you know the reviewers come back and you know we often have a pool of reviewers that review quite a lot for us right so we're like a little community of geopolitics people these are people that themselves publish in geopolitics they might be members of our editorial board they might be former editors of the journal you know they'll say this is a great paper but it doesn't really engage with the geopolitical. It doesn't engage with the conversations that are going on in geopolitics. Um, it might be more suitable for this type of journal, right? Or, um, you know, so for like a, a pure migration studies journal or a much more IR, traditional IR focused journal or a political economy um, focused journal, because it doesn't adequately deal with, with spatiality and temporality in the way that a political geography journal would require. Um, so I think, in, you know, an answer to that question, it's, you know, what, what journals are you drawing on um, and try and publish there. That's exactly what I would have suggested. And just like a sort of a positive sort of as well spin on that. Yeah, I think you could send this article to many mainstream IR journals and, and they will have a look at it. Um, uh, but use, yeah, use your reference list. Sounds like great advice. Um, uh, one last question from an anonymous attendee. <laughs> If a paper has been in review for so long that it's been archived or withdrawn, depending on the journal, how do you proceed with the revising and resubmitting? And whilst this seems like an extreme case, I've been there, right? Like I've, had, I've had one of those things that's just, I've left to sit for a while. And so what do you do with that, um, Polly? You mean that you've taken so long to do the revisions? I don't quite I understand. I guess so, question. yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So the <laughs> I mean, in that case, the review then the journal is gonna is gonna treat it as a new a new submission, right? And it's gonna go out to review all over again. Um, so it's up to you. And I mean, in that time, the editorial team might have even changed. I mean, it's up to you whether you want to keep um, you want to publish it in, in that journal. And but you need to then be clear again in your cover letter, like this was originally sent. Um, you know, and it was, I took so long with the revisions and uh, now I'm back. Um, you need to be clear that that's what's happened. Um, and that, that does happen, right? For many, many reasons, right? Life gets in the way, et cetera, et cetera. As a reviewer, I've also had that experience and the editor has flagged to me, oh yeah, by the way, I think you, you, know, you reviewed this paper for us three years ago. It was an R&R, but something happened and now it's back again and it's a new submission. Can you take a look at it again? And I mean, I'll usually say yes, because I always say I will re-review. If I, if I say revise and resubmit, I always agree to, to look at the revised version as a reviewer. Um, so yeah, I think you just need to be, you need to choose, like, do you still want to publish in that journal or do you want to send it somewhere else? Um, and it could go two ways. The journal could be, could be, glad that you're gonna you've sent it back to them because they still kind of want to publish it or they could be like sorry it's been ages and then they you know you're, you're chancing your luck again um with a whole new fresh round of peer review um but i guess you, you, you just treat it like a new submission i that that would be how i would answer it i don't know about you dashan no i think that that's great advice um and i think that brings us to the end of there the are, list there of... Are a few more questions oh are there are a few more in the chat yeah there's one from Dolly Laumans who asks, okay. Could you what do get to you that? do if you don't understand some of the reviewers' comments? Um, yeah, I mean, that, that can happen, right? I mean, also, I think reviewers sometimes write things super quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they don't always make such coherent sense. Um, I think you, in the first instance, go, for, go off the guidance of the editor. Hopefully the editor has given you some guidance in how to address the reviews. Um, and if you don't know, if you don't understand, I again would ask and flag it with the editor, right? And say, I don't understand this this comment. Like, I, or I mean, flag it with your friends, ask your friends, ask your colleagues. Um, but I think it is something that you can flag in in the if again it's still so confusing that you don't understand. I think it's okay to flag that um, and explain why. And I, I understand the, the fear of doing that, right? You feel like uh, maybe I look like an idiot. Um, but I can tell you, I mean, I, I many 
the reviews I've got back as an author and I'm like, what the fuck are they saying, right? And then I read it and I reread it and I'm like, you know what, I don't think they really know. And I get a colleague to look at it and I'm like, I don't really know either. And I'm like, well, you know, we're not stupid. Like we, we got this far in our career. If I don't understand it after like sitting with it for this long and, you know, I've read a shit ton of super obtuse post-structuralist stuff that I have understood. I don't think the problem is with me. Um, so yeah. That would be my my answer to that. To to to, and I think again, from my perspective as an editor, I want to help you. Um, and if you don't, under, I'd rather you say you don't understand something than than you try and figure it out or spend ages procrastinating about it, freaking out about it. Um, yeah. Thanks, Colleen. And there's I one think I think also from Joshua, who's Joshua Cohen, who's asking about. Ah. Yeah, I mean, this is a tricky one. He's asking about um, when you're, oh. doing a, you're doing a PhD by article and yeah. you get reviews, um, then suggestions that will sort of send your PhD off in a different direction. This is a really tricky one, Joshua, because the PhD by article is a very, um, it's not a very common thing, right? It's only something that kind of happens in, in like the Netherlands and Belgium, really. I don't, it's not common anywhere else. Um, so I don't think journals are going to be, I mean, for me personally, coming from, I, I don't think that geopolitics would be particularly um, uh, sympathetic to a response which says I'm not going to address any of these comments because it sends my PhD argument off in the wrong direction because we're like well we're not we're not your PhD we're we're a scholarly journal and um, this is what is being asked of you by the community um, of reviewers um, you can try and explain that but I, I mean I can tell you now that unless you're lucky enough to get an editor who is based in the Netherlands or Belgium or somewhere that they do do PhD by article, your the editor will probably be like, what the fuck are you talking about? Um, I know, I mean, I have British colleagues, I have American colleagues, I have colleagues from lots of other places. I think they're starting to do PhD by article in Australia now, Dub, are they? I think so. I but I mean, I've been in situations in, you know, PhD vivas and stuff where it's art by article and, you know, the non-Dutch colleagues have no idea what this is. So, mm. um, that's a really difficult question, Joshua. And I, I mean, to be honest, I don't know what the answer to that is. I mean, my sort of my generic suggestion is that like you're always going to have to make compromises in yeah. the review process. And I've never published anything where the final product was exactly the message that I originally wanted to get across. Like, and that's a disciplinary process. Um, uh, but my suggestion is like, you know, if you want to get into the journal, yeah, you, I think Polly's right. You, you have to follow what the editor at least is, is trying to say. You can contextualize that by saying, this is part of a larger project. You know, this is why, you know, there are these other dimensions to it, which I think make this the way to go. But um, ultimately they want to reach their, their audience and um, not your examiners. Um, yeah. And as far as I understand it, right, I mean, your your PhD by article still has to have an introduction and a conclusion, right? And it still has to set up the, the case. And I think then you just have to be, you be clear in that, in the setting up of the whole PhD, that, you know, these are standalone articles, they this, this, they make this argument, but, you know, my, my, you know, individual argument and individual point, but actually my main contribution of my PhD is this. So I think it's also a question for your PhD as much as it is a question, you know, for how to respond to the reviewers. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we've dealt with all the questions now. Um, uh, thank you for sticking with us and thank you for attending. Um, if people have ideas on other things that we can do, we have another residency coming up in October and be happy to host something similar to this maybe even live um, at the AISSR. Um, thanks, Polly. Um, again, Polly's journal is Geopolitics. It's a great political geography journal. Um, and and it's, yes, all the more, it's all the better now that Polly's on board. Um, and uh, yeah, um, uh, I think that's all from, from us. Um, we look forward to, to ending the residency tomorrow and um, I hope you enjoy this sunny day. And I'm off to write my letter in response to my reviewers. <laughs> awesome. Enjoy.
Bye, everybody.